how's it going everybody thank you for joining us here on another episode of dropping the gloves you know it's not often tim i get a guest coming on who i i think i have a cool story you know undrafted free agent rags to riches story makes the nhl all-star game did you know i made the all-star game tim did you know that you brought it up once or twice all-star game appearance mvp no big deal and then this guy comes along and he just one ups me and it's fantastic i love it because there's not enough stories like this but aaron volpati's joining the show aaron thanks for joining us my man yeah thanks for having me guys it's good to be here good to meet you officially officially and officially don't you have a movie so i don't know if is that i don't know if that's one up really well, it's a, gosh, there's been some recent events with this movie. It's a pain in my, no, not yet. I do have a book though. Not as good okay. as yours. My book, it's <laughs> funny. People, they'll ask, you got a book? And I'll go, no, don't buy it because it's garbage. <laughs> I don't like it. So, Did you write I, it? I wrote it. Well, I had a ghostwriter yeah. help me along the way. And he would send me just chapters and I would read the chapters and I would say, these suck. I don't like them. This doesn't sound like me. And so then I would go ahead and write it. And it would just went back and forth. But you know, when you write a book and I was a certain person, you know, I was coming off the show. Everything was great. All-star game. And I think I had an inflated ego and I was just totally. feeling myself and I write a book. And then two years go by and I go, I'm a completely different person. Right. And I'm like, why? So people read that book and they go, oh, John, like loves to do this and that and this and that and the other. And that's not how I am yeah. at all. Now I'm just like Catholic, seven kids, engineer. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I, that was a big challenge for me, too, with my book was just I didn't want to ever be, hey, look what I did. Look at me. And that was or, you know, just opening up and being vulnerable in general, because we're not taught that as a, as men, but in the hockey world. Right. And. So there was two kind of twofold there of the, the challenges, I guess, with it. There's a cat in the background. There's a cat cruises by. Well, let's talk about your book, though, because it's interesting. You played 100 games in the show. Who yeah, cares about 114 whatever. or whatever? Yeah. Who cares about Aaron Volpati? Why, why do I pick up your book if you're just a fourth mm. line schmelt like me? Are you just trying to collect a quick buck? Like what? What's so interesting about Aaron Volpati? No, I mean, at the end of the day, I did this to, I'm like, I can help people with this and empower people with, you know, the power of, of the mind, really. And I think this is probably where our stories maybe overlap a little bit. Uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I was never supposed to play in the NHL. Like, I really wasn't that good. You know, I, above average minor hockey player, sure. But I played house hockey at like 14, yeah, me too. Got, yeah. got cut from select teams, all that stuff. Uh, scored one goal my first year in junior A, and I was just a pure fighter. And I'm not a big guy, but, uh, you know, that's that's what I did. And so I was never supposed to play in the NHL. And then this burn injury happened. And so, yeah, really, like, if you want to talk about odds stacked against you, I mean, again, I don't like to maybe toot my own horn look what i did but it, more the message is if i can play in the nhl believe me you can do anything you want because it was, I was funny i was my I, my parents are visiting from canada oh, i'm yeah. in michigan now and we're at dinner and my mom goes you know i think your older brother could have made the nhl he was a really good hockey player and i had to stop her in her tracks and i said jamie was good he was like I think people just think it's somewhat easy to make the NHL where they just see right. people on the TV and like, okay, if I really work hard, I can make it. No, you can't. There, there takes a certain level of talent and adverse, like overcoming adversity. And you yeah. have to have, so I, I know you're selling yourself short where it's like, okay, I, I had one goal and this and that your, your college coach. I, I read, he said you were the, the hardest hitter he's ever seen ever. That so was you, my thing. I could always hit. But yeah. that's hard to do. That's yeah. very difficult to do. So you you had some talent. 
a lot of people have talent, but you have to work with that. It takes a lot of mental strength to be able to say, okay, I'm not going to score goals. This is how I'm going to make it to the NHL. Did right. you ever see guys? We talked about this with Michael Pizzetta. Did you ever see guys who were just incredibly talented and they just yeah. didn't have the work ethic? Oh, all the time. And I think that's what, you know, how, how many guys did you play with that had loads more talent than you and they never made it? Right. Because I think that filter as you move up starts, it starts getting like this, starts getting smaller and smaller. And then it's like, okay, what else do you do? Right. Yeah. You got to do something. You got to do something else. And sometimes it was just, are you willing to do what other people don't want to do? Like, I didn't really want to fight guys that were six, five and 240 pounds. I'm like six, one, two Oh five. So I don't really want to do that, but I know I'm not going to make it you know, <laughs> the other way. So, uh, yeah, I, it, it's, a, it's a tough one, but you have to, you have to have something else. Um, because the guys with talent, when thing, I think that's the big thing when things start getting hard, then what, then what, and then they fall off because it's hard. And like you said, that journey might take, I was 25 when I turned pro. So that journey might take a while. Yeah. And I think a lot of, I think now, I don't know what you see where you guys are, but it it's a full-time job for these kids at like 10 years old. And no wonder they, they're burnt out at 18, you know, and it's a full-time job from like such a young age. I don't know, like I, that's a whole other topic, but yeah, you can have all the talent in the world, but when you're just like, man, I'm, I'm out, you know, I've, I've, I see that all the time. Well, because it is a job. I think you you nailed it where it, it's not fun anymore. And, I, you know, well, I know yeah. we're throwing stones, but you, you just look at the way people take, they approach hockey nowadays. They're, they're everybody, they have a, a trainer, they have a nutritionist, yeah. they have all this stuff 24 seven mental coaches. I didn't have any of that junk. No, there's, yeah, exactly. And there's like non sanctioned leagues here for eight year olds. And it's like, whoa, what are we doing here? You know, and it's I, a lot. I, and I, I say this to like people I work with and, and everything where, you know, if you, when you're like 14 to 18, then it's time to like start getting obsessed. And if you want to do something, you have a window here, but you're like talking about eight, nine, 10, 11 year olds. Like, I, I don't know, just go have fun. You're a kid. And yeah, I think it's that's, impossible that's what's be... getting, it is. Cause then they well, my, my son or daughter will fall behind. Yeah. And it's like, hey, you and I played house hockey at 14. They'll be fine. Ex yeah. But, but going back to your story, I'm looking at your stats, where you came from, how you developed. You went to Brown. You got the sweater on, obviously, bragging. Oh, yeah. I didn't um, realize that till now, yeah. <laughs> and Brown's a good school. It's it's a great yeah. Division One school. How do you – you did not put up points in the BCHL. No. And I, I'm not I'm not throwing shade because I didn't do it with MTU. I was a stay-at-home defenseman. You're a forward. Yeah. How do you go from the Vernon Vipers where you're getting 18 points in 57 games to going to Brown and getting a scholarship? How does that work? Yeah, well, this is where the this is where the story, I guess, gets good, or it's like the meat of the story is yeah. when I really learned about the power of of the mind and and the visualization piece. So uh I guess that it's a good segue. I'll just go right into it. So yeah. my sec my second year in Vernon we lost out in the finals and and back then you know this is 20 years ago i don't know what the kids do now but we would go party for a week that's just what we did right they go train now yeah and cry <laughs> yeah so it was like day two or three of this this bender and i was always that guy that maybe a lot of us at a as a young teenager that you know you think you're invincible doing stupid things and I was always a pyro so I was always messing around with gas and fire and no again kidding. part of it was I think we we chatted about this before jumping on here but I was feed and I can reflect now and and understand this but I was just feeding a young ego you know mm -hmm. whether it be I was living up to that fighter stereotype I guess you could say where hey you're the crazy guy and Part of it was, hey, I like the adrenaline and I like the attention from from maybe girls that comes of it or whatever, right? It's mm -hmm. just 
you're just feeding a, an ego. Yeah. And, and so that's what I did. And I thought I was invincible. And one thing led to another and we were camping out in the bush, like I said, day two or three of this bender. And uh, yeah, I was make, basically doing a spin off Molotov cocktails. So I was like basically blowing up uh, beer bottles full of gas. And so not smart, obviously. Um, and I actually had two wine bottles full of gas. No and I was, way. And I was walking around the party. And I was like kind of getting everyone revved up. I had done this the year before. Yeah. And everything went up without a hitch. And everything was fine. And I mean, it's all fine until someone gets hurt, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, all of a sudden, I felt soaking wet. So I'm walking around. And we'd obviously been drinking. And um, yeah, and I'm like, I have a liter and a half of gas on me now. And I'm, I know there's a fire and I know I have gas and I know, Hey, I probably shouldn't get too close to this thing, but I didn't respect the dangers of, you know, gasoline or the gasoline vapors, yeah, right? The they fumes. just kind of settle around you. And I think maybe five minutes or so went by and I'm like, I got to get this sweater off. Like I just reek like gas and maybe I didn't want to litter. Or maybe I'm like, well, I'll just light the sweater on fire but that gas is still all over me. Right. And so I keep what I think is a safe distance away. And I, you know, give the ground a little kick and it was just like, and, and up I went. And unfortunately I bolted and it, that fight or flight takes over. And I just, and I was pretty quick. So I just shot out of and a the cannon. fire just engulfed. I'm on you. fire. Yeah. You can't put out a gas fire, which I didn't know at the time. Yeah. And uh, I just couldn't get it out and uh, obviously did a lot of damage. And finally, people always ask me, like, were you in a lot of pain? And, you know, that shock takes, it's kind of like being in a fight. You don't feel it in the moment, yeah. right? And uh, I just remember feeling really warm and in no pain. There was this eerie sense of calmness to the whole thing. And... I feel like that's probably what dying feels like, you know, just mm -hmm. peace. I was warm. And then all of a sudden, finally, I got hit from behind and the guys tackled me and started beating me with their jackets. Like everyone burnt their hands trying to put this thing out. No kidding. And uh, so that's how it all, that's how the journey really started for me. So unfortunately, we were out in the bush, 30 minutes, no, sir, 30 minutes from town, no cell service. Um, thankfully, one of the guy's girlfriends wasn't drinking. I, piled in her car and we sped off to the hospital and uh yeah you want to talk about pain when that shock started wearing off uh that burn injury is like nothing else so at what I, point do you finally just uh, you probably weren't composed the whole time because it's a crazy you can only imagine at what point do you just take a second when you're in the car driving to the hospital and you look down and you go Hol holy moly i'm gonna yeah. die that that came a little bit earlier when I remember I got sat on a cooler, so I'm totally naked. There's yeah. nothing left of my clothes. They're all burnt off, uh, dirty, burnt. And then I just remember, oh, again, man. being in shock and, like, looking at everyone's faces at the party. And people were crying. People, like, had their nose covered because the smell of burnt skin is like nothing you've ever smelled. It's, it's terrible. And so I'm like, okay, this must be bad. And I kind of meet their gaze and look down. And then I realize, like, okay this is serious. And, uh, that's when I was like, Whoa, I'm, like how about, you know, I didn't really comprehend the whole thing. I just knew it was, it was serious. Anyways, I, I run into the emergency room, <laughs> butt naked that, that night at whatever time. And then everything went black. They knocked me out and then got airlifted to Vancouver with the medicine. They knocked with me with medicine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. With medicine. Uh, I'm assuming because that's what <laughs> just <laughs> one punched you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, woke up in Vancouver. And and again, that's where the, the journey really started. But so I, I won't try and ramble on too much. But so when I about day three in the burn unit, um, the first few days were pretty foggy. I don't remember a lot. Um, but there's a procedure called debridement. I don't know mm -hmm. if you guys are familiar with that, but it's basically, no. it's basically torture. They just like, they slice you open and they pressure wash your skin off and they got to keep the, those third degree burns 
clean for future skin grafts. <laughs> so you had to get that done every third. You're not awake for it. Because but... it starts to scab over or try to heal itself. The scar tissue just gets real oh. thick, real fast. So they have to, every third day, take all that off. Aaron. Uh, oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah, man, it, it's nasty stuff. And so I come out of this first debridement procedure because until then, no one really knew. They knew, I mean, there's only 10 beds in the burn unit in British Columbia at that time. Like, it's the 10 worst burns. So we knew I'm pretty banged up, obviously. Yeah. But they don't know kind of to what degree. So I come out of the anesthetic from that first debridement. And then the doctor says, you know, you're obviously very lucky. This could have been a lot worse. Um, you're 40% second, third degree burns. Like you're going to need a lot of grafting. You're going to be in here for a while. So how old are you? And so I'm 19, almost 20. Okay. And so to your point, uh, I mean, this is a long winded answer, but it's a, it's an important part of the story. No, yeah, think, It's but, great. Like, my NHL and my dream was just to go to college. That's what I wanted to do. You know, I wasn't, I didn't want to be naive and think about playing pro hockey because I really didn't have a reason to, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, again, you, you've seen my stats in junior. They, I could, I didn't even talk to a, an NCAA scout until this point. So I'm like, but I could always hit. So I'm yeah. like, and I, I slowly added a layer to my game every year. I penalty killed my second year and then, my third year, I was like, maybe I can play on like the third line and just be that guy and get a scholarship. I mean, mm -hmm. Vernon was one of the best teams in the country. So that helped too. Mm -hmm. And so in my head, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapped like a money mummy. I can't move. And this doctor's laying this, you know, uh, this information to me. And, and I said, well, I have camp in, in three and a half months or whatever. So this is in like a end of April. Yeah. And we have camp in like start of September, right? Or even before that. Yeah, August, end of August. Yeah. And uh I'll never forget his his face. He kind of just froze. And it was like one of this poor kid thinks he's gonna be playing hockey in a in a few months. And he's like, Listen, these recoveries take years, not not months. Wow. He's like, You're not gonna be playing hockey in a in a few months here. Uh maybe in a couple of years we'll look to get you in a pair of skates in a non-competitive environment kind of thing uh but let's just focus on your recovery it's you're going to be in here for a while and it's going to be a long road and that was the dialogue and so my career was over at at that moment i'm like okay i mean i was just happy i was going to make a full recovery yeah right um but i was also on the other hand you know that identity gets taken away from you and it's like, okay, what am I going to do with my life now? I mean, I was young, but hockey was all, you know. So right? what, and, like you talk about mental strength, like you're 19, you're not even fully mentally developed yet. Men don't get there until they're 25, 30. Like he, what well, do I you, got thrust into that yeah. because of this, right? So what do you do? Do you just, you have a good cry, you figure it out and then you like make a decision? Yeah. I mean, somewhat. So two weeks go by and I was doing just that, you know, having a good, I mean, the pain pretty much just was the main thing you're trying to cope with. Cause it's like, again, the burn unit is not a good place. Uh, and I get a call from my coach two weeks in and he's like, Hey, I, you know, how you doing? And trying to find some sick humor and, and the whole thing. <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, not great, been better. And he said, I, I was just talking to the assistant coach from Brown University and he's like, we're looking for this type of player. His exact words were, we want a guy to put the fear of God in the defenseman of the Ivy League. And my coach is like, I got the perfect guy for no, you. That's funny. There's just uh, there's just one problem, one major problem. He's uh, He's in the burn unit and the future doesn't look great. So my coach is like, they want to talk. You just call them. He's like, I know you got the time. And so I had a little laugh and my parents take down the number. Cause you got to remember, I, I'm full mummy. I like can't move. My parents hold the phone up to my ear and I talk to this coach from Brown. First time I've heard a Rhode Island accent, which was interesting. And he was, I don't know. You might know Danny Brooks. He, he scouts in, in the NHL now, but mm -hmm. just, just a character. And it was left really open-ended 
you know, he said, we're sorry to hear what happened. We wish you the best in recovery kind of thing. And, and that was kind of it. And I remember hanging up the phone. And again, you, I mean, you want to talk about getting emotional. I've like, I'm like, I've worked my whole life to talk to one of these guys. And I'm like, look where I am. Look what I've done to myself. I blew it. Yeah, I blew it. And then I just remember I started asking questions in my head. I'm like, okay, so, so why can't I play hockey? And there was a huge list of reasons why. Yeah. You know, infection was probably the biggest. Um, with burns, it's a it's a major risk. And then the skin grafts were going to be very limiting, very painful. Just they're going to take years to heal. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd, I had to wear a full body suit for two years. You can't sweat. So at the time, they're like, if you're going to have grafts to 30, 40 percent of your body, there could be complications there with heart rate and sweating, right? Because you burn through everything. And why can't you burns. sweat? Because you a third degree burn, you burn through everything. So it's so deep. You you can't, So I can't feel my skin grafts because there's no nerves there. So nerve, nerve glands, sweat glands, everything. And so when your heart rate gets up, you need to sweat, obviously, right? And that's yeah. it, anytime you're so I was just I think under that cusp, maybe but if you're over 50% grafts, there's major uh, complications there when your heart rate gets going. So anyways, there's this huge list of reasons why they're saying I can't play. And, and to your point, I just, and there's a, a lot of power, a lot of power in just making a, a choice and a decision. Yeah. And I said, I'm like, that's not going to be me. I don't accept this uh, diagnosis. And I, I really made the, my mentality was I'm willing to die before I give up on that. And I'm going to see it through and, and make sure this happens. And and uh, that's where people ask me, like, how did you discover visualization? And and this is how I didn't have a choice because I was bedridden in a hospital. I like all I could do was think all day. And prior to that, it was all, I mean, mostly dealing with the pain, but all the negative stuff that came along with that, like, look look what's my life going to look like now poor me all these negative things yeah. right and- so do you think that it's funny i i'm religious we have this thing and so a, a small as mustard seed and it grows into a massive plant mm-hmm. do you think that one phone call even though it was just completely innocuous open-ended you didn't did, if you didn't have that call what happens to you yeah i don't know and I've thought about that and people have asked me that. And I, I, I don't think I would have came back. Yeah. I really don't. Um, so I always like to say, I mean, to that kind of related to that is that I, I think like all of us have a, a path or a map set out for us mm-hmm. in life. Oh, definitely. Right. And some people don't, don't maybe don't believe that. Or they do believe that, but they can't navigate it because it gets hard at times, and then they make a different turn. Um, but I think my point with that is that there's signs along the way, you know, on the in life, and I've had a lot of them. And this is mm-hmm. the first. This was the first major one I had, or like fork in the road, right? Where it's like, hey, they're da- dangling a carrot over here. Like, you know, maybe you should go down this one. It's going to be hard. Yeah, and. And so, but yeah, I, I think I probably, my life looks a lot different if I don't get that call. Well, you don't got some fancy jerseys hanging behind you, right? That's for yeah, sure. No, there'll be maybe jerseys of, uh, of you and, uh, some other guys. <laughs> I'll send you a jersey. We'll get you, we'll get you some decent players right there, but let okay. Me, yeah, let yeah. me ask you, I have a quick question. Ahead, so, so, yeah. okay. This is really fascinating. I want to hear more about the, the, the mentality stuff. Cause I want to remind the listeners that you're this decision point and you rejecting the doctor's diagnosis and the timeline you're kind of taking into your own hands the nhl is still not even on your radar at this point this is just to play college hockey right it's it's not even remotely on my radar no um and so it's funny i actually did a podcast yesterday with it was called girls got girls girls with graphs so burn survivor community and i told them and and i always say this like i'm not necessarily advocating for people to defy doctors i think the point is like don't let an injury maybe specifically a burn injury don't let it define you or define the rest of your life because i almost did and 
like you said, I don't have any of these behind me if 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 I don't do that. Um, so so going back to the visualization piece, I just started visualizing like again, like all I could do is think. So all day long, I just I started creating like a movie in my head, and I just started imagining like a bunch of things. I imagined healing faster like at a cellular level like i just imagine those graft areas getting smaller and shrinking and and healing uh, imagine walking out of the hospital and then putting on my gear for that home opener that game and then i would just obsess over signing that commitment letter to brown over and over and over and over again and i would just start i, I started reframing the pain so i would just be like this is your body healing and I almost imagine like my body was like eating the pain, if that makes sense. And mm -hmm. the mind's so crazy powerful, like the pain started getting more manageable and I'm, I started feeling better. And I people think I'm crazy when I say this, but I know I healed faster in the burn unit because of this. Um, and yeah, it, it so I mean, long story short, it, it worked. And I ended up getting a scholarship to Brown. I mean, it's not technically a scholarship as you, you know, with the Ivy Academic League. Academic assistance or whatever. Yeah. I call it, I just say scholarship. But, yeah. uh, but hey, that doesn't mean it was an easy road. Like my body fought back with everything it had. Cause mm -hmm. I, the doctors were right. I had no business, put, I shouldn't have been playing hockey. Like if you would have seen like what I looked like under my gear, that year like people yeah. were like what is this guy doing like i had open second degree burns still in under my gear mm -hmm. um but like i don't know man i had i had kidney stones the day after i got out of the burn unit i had an appendectomy a week before training camp they had to cut through my graft oh. my <laughs> so i had i had every reason to quit and it was it was hard and i had a pelvis issue because the burns to my thighs were so deep that I had major stability issues with my pelvis and I could, I was on crutches coming to and from the rink. And I'm, again, I had this mentality where I was, and this is when you could also get shot up with any painkiller you wanted. Yeah. So, I mean, that didn't hurt. Um, the toradol was flowing. The toradol was flowing for sure. Um, but anyways, they, Brown comes to watch me. I, I get a scholarship a few weeks later wow. and then that's why I only played 20 something games my last year in junior, because I was holding on by a thread. I wouldn't have made it the whole year. Um, and uh, so to your point, Tim, so I go to Brown and I just had fun, man. Like I worked my butt off and, and I was in shape, but I was like, you know, college fourth line. I have a lineup sometimes. They had my 10 points a year in 30, whatever games, nothing crazy. And yeah, my perspective on life had also changed where I'm just like, I, I did it. I reached my NHL and I'm just going to go live it up and, and have a good time. And that's what I did. And I was 24 years old in my junior year and still had never even thought about pro hockey. I mean, some guys were like, hey, you could go play in the SP or the CHL to say you did it. And I'm yeah. like, that didn't appeal to me really like to try. I, I took pre-med, so I was like going to go that road. And my, again, so I had another like kind of sign on this this map. My My assistant coach after my junior year was like, pulled me aside after the season and said, hey, you ever thought about playing pro hockey? And I, I laughed. I was like, dude, I'm 24 years old and I I'm on the fourth line in college. Like, no, <laughs> I've never thought about it. Yeah. And he's like, I've never seen anyone hit the way you can hit. I think if you like really worked on your game, uh, I think you could have a solid like five, 10 year career in the American league and, you know, maybe even get a shot in the show one day. And I was like, wow, okay, thank you. Uh, and I didn't really know what to say. And I went home that night and I kind of, again, I had this moment where I was like, hey, ding dong, like, what have you been doing these last <laughs> few years? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, man, if if I can do that and come back from this crazy burn injury to just even come back to play hockey, then why can't I play in the NHL? And that seemed to be an easier task <laughs> than the burn injury. So I, again, I just made a choice. I said, I'm going to play in the NHL. 
Well, again, yeah. I think it, I think men are wired that way. I you need that dangling carrot, something to go for. Because while you're, I, I did the same thing at Tech. Tim always says I make it about myself. I had my same assistant coach. He's like, "Hey, John, you can't coach six foot eight. Like you got something other people don't have. Like let's try to figure this out." Right. And you need that carrot to kind of go for. It. So you had it with the phone call with Brown. You had the assistant coach. You had obviously some foresight to give you that. You end up having a fantastic senior season. You light it up. You're putting a point per game, a ton of PIMS for some reason. I don't know if you're just getting 10 minute misconducts or what. Yeah, maybe a- the odd one, but mostly just I was I was killing guys in my last year. Like yeah, I'm 25 playing against 18 year olds. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I was probably 215 my senior year. And I like, I just, I mean, there's more like I became obsessed and I had to go back to the visualization mm-hmm. piece. Um, so there's a reason that it that senior year was was so good. Um, and then you get the call from Vancouver. You're a free agent, which is a benefit to you at this point. Right. You're not tied oh, to a team. You're coming out. People were probably salivating. Let's get this guy. Why Vancouver? Yeah. Why pick that situation when the, you knew their depth chart was yeah. insane? I mean, part of it was money at the time because I had yep. none. <laughs> <laughs> I had negative money, you know, like <laughs> my family was very working class. And uh, so Vancouver offered me a really good deal, two way deal uh, compared to the other ones. The other ones were your, you know, your typical two way uh, 60K in the American League minimum in the NHL. Yeah. And, and Vancouver was paying me a lot of money in the minors. So I, I'm not going to lie. That was a big factor. I didn't know how long like this career was going to was going to last yeah um so that was a big big reason for it uh they were they were the first team to approach me and i mean the fact that it was my home province team didn't didn't hurt so those were the main factors for sure but yeah to your point the being a free agent at it, yeah it, it was the best thing that could have happened because you know i i think i had like six or seven or eight contract offers and no kidding oh yeah yeah and that's the cool part about the story, you know, at 24, I don't think anyone in the NHL even knew who I was. And then within six, seven months, eight months, uh, I was probably, again, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I, I went from no one knowing to everyone knowing yeah, and probably a top five NCAA free agent. Um, again, the points were they weren't out of this world, but, but it's more when I had that complete package now. Um, Again, I don't want to advocate for hurting people, but you know, I had this mentality, like get out of my way or get your head up because I'm going here. Uh, And yeah, you're playing against younger kids. And I was just, you know, physically dominating and then having the points that just put that whole package together. So I got uh, on the fast forward a little bit. So you're playing in the A, you're getting some pro experience, what are the conversations like with uh, the NHL coaches? Your first call up, your first skate. Like, what? What is that? Walk us through that. Yeah, that's a funny story because when I when I first started in the American League, I was slotted like top six because I had a good senior year. They signed me for a lot of money. I actually I played a great first couple games. Uh, had two assists my first games. Hit a post on the power play. <laughs> Uh, I fought Wade Brookbank, uh, which, you know, that's more like your weight class. And He's a tough kid. Tough dude, man. But so I remember it was like spur of the moment. I never did good with the square offs. I just, I struggled with those. But the spur of the moment, I kind of tagged him with one. <laughs> We're skating to the bench and he was real mad. He's like yelling at me, we're going again. And I was like, oh man, that was, I didn't know it was uh, him. No, we're not. <laughs> I didn't know it was him. I was like, I'm taking that win, man. Sorry. <laughs> I ain't fighting. I'm not squaring off with you. But anyways, I had a good first few games and I was like, wow, like, you know, I, I could really do this thing maybe in, in the NHL be not a top six, but maybe a third liner kind of thing. And, and then of course things start drying up and I, I, I just couldn't. And then I got back to the fourth line. You know how it is in pro. You're not going to produce. Like, there's lots of guys that we can bring up that can. And so I just started fighting all the time. And I did pretty well. And But the reason that it's a, it's a little bit funny is because I was like the odd healthy scratch in the minors by game 10, 15, 20. 
and barely holding the lineup spot. But I had uh, this game in Abbotsford. I called it the double homicide. I had a few of them that year where I'd hit a guy, <laughs> he'd be out. <laughs> I'd hit a guy, he'd be out cold. Again, I'm not advocating for hurting anyone, but I got called up a week later um, and fought a guy, put him down. So they're both lying on the ice. And this is in Abbotsford. So all the Canucks brass is there. And you just leave the it, ice and unpack your gear and go to Vancouver after every knockout. Pretty I'm much <laughs> in a way. But so I'm back in Manitoba. The coach calls me into his office. It was uh, Claude Noel. And him and I didn't really, we got into it a few times just so that the dynamic was the moose wanted way more from me because they're like, we're paying you a pretty good salary here. Like, and they're paying some of it right in the minors with the being privately owned. Yeah. yeah. I think. Talk fighting. Like you're talking f- points, not fighting points. Right. Okay. They want points. They want production. Yeah. They're like, we're paying you a lot of money. Like, to to produce and yeah. vancouver vancouver and my agent are calling me they're like we love it like keep doing <laughs> what you're doing and so i'm like who the hell do i listen to vancouver <laughs> right yeah and that's a, that's what my agent said he's like where do you want to play yeah so anyways this coach calls me in right before christmas in the in the with the moose and i'm thinking he's gonna like we're gonna get into it again and he's gonna say you're not playing tonight i need more from you and he kind of just shakes his head he's like pack your bag you're going up to vancouver i was like whoa i didn't expect that (laughs) but that's how it all went down and went up and stayed up for about two months uh my first year and that was the year they went to the finals so we had a stacked team yeah that's the year they beat i was with the hawks game seven in overtime that was crazy yeah but let's i I don't want to skip past fighting because i i obviously have been in a few fights myself (laughs) <laughs> you're not a big dude you, you you're a very efficient puncher you have a piston for an arm where it just you start and you don't stop um how do you get that mentality because you, the way you fight you're gonna eat punches like you you're not playing defense which is i love fighting guys like that well how, yeah. how do you approach a fight well, like you that? do you're no, six and nine well, because yeah, no one reaches me. So I'm like, let's do this. The only guy yeah, who could yeah. reach me was Fraser McLaren. He had these massive uh, arms. Yeah. yeah. But what when you're going into a game and you're gonna fight it like you fought some heavies. Like what's your mentality going into that? Yeah, well, that started to change a little bit um with the bigger dudes, especially. Yeah. Like, so I was a I boxed growing up. My dad was a gold gloves boxer. That uh helps. so yeah. we boxed. I could throw both hands really well Mm -hmm. but yeah i didn't have a lot of defense and part of that was through junior when i was a fighter not a lot of guys had maybe the knockout power maybe like that they would in in pro right you're not quite a man it's not to say you you couldn't but i could get away with it and i won most of my fights because i would just yeah my face would look a little barked up but uh people didn't really want to hang in there and go shot for shot so i and then in college you don't fight yeah. So I, I translated that, uh, into pro and it served me well for the most part. But once I started fighting guys like Revo and like Brad Staubitz and like, I don't know, all those kind of guys, right. Bigger, like even like a Brad Winchester bigger. guys who are bigger than you. Yeah. And that's when, you know, I could f- list off a handful of them, but when I'm going shot for shot with Revo and he dings one off my helmet, I'm like, that's probably not the smartest thing. Cause if he puts one here, I'm going to be sleeping. Yeah. So I went for the takedown, <laughs> but, uh, so I had to get a little bit smarter. Um, but when I fought guys, you know, Brownie or, or toots, those guys, and I go shot for shot with them, I got away with it. I mean, I say that in a not knocked out, got away with it, but mm-hmm. man, those guys were bulldogs and I don't, you know, I almost found the smaller guys in a way harder to fight because I say that always. I, I couldn't yeah, see they're, Cam punching, Jansen they're, they're, they're like it. this and they're punching up. Yeah. Where you as a big guy, unless you sneak in an uppercut, I mean, some of my best fights were with with bigger guys because I would kind of like I would just I'd I'd hold them, but I'd protect myself and I'd let them ding a few off my helmet. And as long as I don't get hit with an uppercut. 
I could even like kind of like go down on a knee and then come up real quick mm -hmm. and they don't expect it. You know, I tagged, a, I remember I fought Andy Sutton and I Andy tagged Sutton. him, tagged him with one of those. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It was just, I guess my point is I, I definitely had to get a little smarter. Yeah. As time went on, because the first couple of years pro, I was like, I, I didn't mind the, the role. I liked it. And I'm like, bring it on. I, I like black eyes and live that fighter stereotype. But, you know, after that summer we had with those guys that, that lost their lives. And, and then I started thinking, like, I started thinking more about my health and I'm like, I've had a lot of concussions and I'd rather not get punched in the head by, you know, someone that's six, five, two forty. Like, mm -hmm. what's that going to do for me later? So I started thinking about that more and tried to get a little smarter. Um, but that's when, that's when it started getting tough, you know, with the anxiety stuff as a lot of guys will, you know, I don't know how you felt, but. Oh, big time. Yeah. I, I, I can't remember which podcast I was listening to. It could have even been, been yours. It was someone's, but they, they said it perfectly. It was like, imagine the bully in your school comes to you early in the morning and he's the biggest, toughest kid in school and says, hey, I'm taking you out back and the whole school is going to be watching. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you feel all day? You're thinking about that. And, you know, it's you get anxious about it. And that's kind of the, it's similar in the NHL. You know, OK, I get in a fight with whoever and then right away in my head, I can usually make it through that next game. But right after that game, I'm like. Oh, I, I got Revo in, in two days. Guess what? I'm thinking about that for two yeah. days. Well, that's right? the maddening part about the NHL or pro hockey. It's like you can go to the calendar and be like, all right. For yeah. me, it was like I got McIntyre, McGrath, yeah. or <laughs> McLaren. Like murder is raw. And was like, oh, geez. It's, I'd rather it's, not do that, yeah. right? Yeah, I'm going to say no to that guy, that guy. Yeah. And I'm going to lose my job, so I have to say yes. So I got one more fight. That was it. Which Which one? Pick one fight for the listeners to go and watch. Which one are you most proud of? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, it probably it probably have to be the Winchester fight because okay. that was my welcome to the NHL full time moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was another double homicide that game. I knocked out Demers from a hit earlier. Jason Demers, friend yeah. of the show. <laughs> Oh no! Yeah, sorry, sorry, Demers. <laughs> Not like uh, I don't. He was hurt. He didn't come back. But um, and then Winchester. You know, this was exhibition, and so he. I don't know why he he did it, but he he kind of sprinted at me and and went to grab me, and I was I was kind of put off guard, and I just took a step back, and he kind of missed his grab and left himself open, and bonk. After that game, Stan Smeal. I remember gave me like a wink, like, and I was like, I knew I made it, a f you know, for real. Cause that was my second year and we had just lost to the Bruins mm. and we, we needed to get tougher. And they brought in like Owen Nolan, Todd Fedoric, all these guys into camp. And I had that game and I, and I knew that was it. So, uh, there's, there's a bunch of other good ones, but, uh, that's probably the most impactful. It's funny, Mon, one of my yeah. favorite ones that I, I watch daily is um versus the Canucks where I fought um Alexander Bolduke. You and fought oh yeah, I remember <laughs> I separated both his shoulders, I think, and he had a concussion. He was out for the year, I think. But I remember I don't know if I was up. I, I remember the story for sure, and everyone was just yelling at him like, no. Rippin was screaming <laughs> don't from the do bench. It, <laughs> well, the scary thing was with we were I was with the wild at that point, and yeah, we were yeah. up by five two, and we had Derek Bugard. Right. And so Hordachuk jumps on the ice and he's trying to, you know, <laughs> fight me. Yeah. And Boogie's like, nah, you're going to fight me. And Bogard was like, talk about toughest guy ever. So he grabs Hordachuk yeah. and beats him up. And Bull Duke jumps over the boards and he's like, I have to fight you. No, you, <laughs> no, you don't. Like, you don't have to. And I'm like, all right, man. I, I had never heard of him before. I, I didn't know he was tough. And I just, like, it was, it was not good and beat him yeah. up. And that was my first like kind of foray into the Vancouver because you guys were tough. You had a tough team. You had Rippin yeah. yourself at a time. You had Hortichuk. You had yeah, Bull Duke. Glasser, you know, Tanner Glass. Yeah. Tanner Glass. But all gamers, you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 We had a that was a 
I mean, people say that that first, that 2010 to 12, like that was maybe some of the best teams they ever had. Um, yeah, and it wasn't, that was when I, I mean, aside from Horty, we didn't really have like true heavyweights. You know, yeah. we could, we could play. I mean, my stats don't really show that, but you know, we could skate and and make plays. But yeah, that was when, you know, the fourth line wasn't necessarily expected to contribute. It was kind of a bonus. Yeah. Whereas if you're providing energy and that sandpaper, you'll play. Whereas... Our fourth line was up. <laughs> we had Voros, we had Bugard, and we had Clutterbuck. And oh, then yeah. I would jump on defense. And if we got up by three goals, the other team's tough guys were just like, gosh, yeah, what are we going to do? Like, who are we going to fight? I it was know. bad. That was... That was the worst, man. Like if if the team was if your team was down by a few oh. goals with 10 minutes left, it's like, oh, you're like, I I kind of have a headache from the last fight and my hands are messed. And I'm like, yeah, it's like, you know, I'd rather not. But if I don't, am I gonna be here tomorrow? Like, that's the tough part, right? I always hated in the first period if they scored on the first because you you I would get the fourth shift unless there was a penalty. Then I'd get the sixth shift, seventh shift. Yeah. <laughs> if they scored early, I'm like, damn it. Oh, no. Now I got to yeah. go fight for a shift. Like, I, I haven't, I'm not even into the game. I don't want to do this. But before you could be like, sorry, man, tie game. Like, let's just get into the game. Like, let's right. go play a little bit. I would never ask because yeah. I wanted to play. But if, it, if I was down a goal, son of a gun. Like, now we got to go fight in your yeah. pole. And I hated doing yeah. that. I didn't like the stage fights. I like, no. I, I despise it. Tim Tim used to fight all the time. He loved just squaring up with guys. <laughs> Tim's never yeah, throwing a totally punch me. at anybody. <laughs> um, I, so, sorry, I do want to ask about oh, this yeah. Canucks team because I think you're the first guy we've interviewed who's part of that core, and it's probably one of the best cores of the last 20 years with Luongo, Sedins, and Burroughs, and Bieksa, and all those guys. Um, but they never won a cup. Volpatti. And, and I, yes, Volpatti. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, so I, I know it's hard, obviously, and and not every every team's gonna get gonna get that cup. But do you have any in ideas or insights into why that group was never able to kind of get over that hump and and get it done? That's a good question. Uh, I mean, it was so close, right? Yeah. Um, so I was a black ace on that run, so we kind of had like our own, you know how how it works. I, like, I, I've been a black in, ace many you're times. Kind of in your own world, you're not really <laughs> yeah. part yeah. of the team, but. Uh, I, I don't know. Like I know guys said that there was a lot of nerves <clears throat> before the game and that might've had something to do with it where versus the Bruins apparently were just, you know, really kept it light and treated it like any other game. So I think that could have been part of it, uh, as a whole, I don't think there's a specific reason really. I mean, that was a deep, deep team, uh, it's a good league and you know, I, it's tough to win and it's, you know, little things can just make a difference. Like, like maybe being too nervous and that was the final straw maybe. Right. But I don't know. It could have, I think a lot of guys said that that Aaron Rome hit changed the whole series. Oh, right. I'm and bored. it did yeah. that. that yeah. It changed everything. Cause we were up, I think three, one or two, one at the time. Uh, so I don't know, like it, you're so close. I mean, we we could have won in five or six games, and then it's a whole different, you know, conversation. So, so I don't think there's anything, any reason or anything specific as to why. But I think once Game Seven hit, there was a lot of you could feel the tension in the whole city, and I think it was maybe just too much. Uh, yeah. So I don't know how much you, you keep up with like the headlines, but but yesterday Chara shared this story, and uh, you know what I'm gonna say. He he said uh, no, no. He uh, he they didn't personally see it, but on Game Six in Boston, the Canucks players were reportedly practicicing and talking about how they were gonna hand off the cup, and like in in oh, Boston really? they're planning on winning that night. No and they said, way! Like, I don't believe it. So, so, so I don't know so, that I, I can't say I lived in the black so, ace. <laughs> go ahead, Tim, right? Sorry. And so, so the and I guess like like the trainers or the arena staff like told them because they were watching the Canucks practice or something. And that was uh, yesterday. He was on some show talking about it. And BX uh, like it, last it, night it. or early this morning commented like that absolutely did not happen. There's yeah. no chance. 0%. I find that hard to believe. Yeah, and I think Chara believes it. I don't I think know why. Big... Told them that or 
I don't think, I don't think he'd be one to just throw things out like that. No, right. I mean, he, but I was going to ask. I don't. That doesn't sound Big Z is the biggest dirt bag that's ever put <laughs> skates on. Just a bad yeah. human. Talk about a guy who would dunk a fight. <laughs> I would ask him relentlessly. Oh, he, yeah. he picks his point. He, oh, no, you only play seven minutes. I'm like, I don't care. Still beat yeah. the doors off, Big Z. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't, find don't that hard. Small guy. I find yes, I don't. I find that hard to believe, but again, I I didn't. Yeah. We kind of lived on the sidelines a little bit. Uh, one quick funny story with with that series. So they put us Black Aces in Boston in the stands with the wives. Oh. Like who drew that one up? The Bruins' wives too, which was strange. Oh my! God. <laughs> and man, like I legit thought I was gonna get in a fight with these nut jobs in Boston. Like they were calling us and the wives every name you could imagine. And uh, I'm like, I obviously can't get in a fight with a fan, but I feel like this guy's going to come at me and then I'm going to have no choice. It was, it was bananas. People from yeah. Boston. They're crazy, would, but they're in a worst. good way, like yeah. they're the worst, but I mean, they're, they're passionate. Passionate. Uh, let's to say a that. Fault. Yeah. To a fault maybe. Tim, but, where yeah, are you from? <laughs> I'm from Boston. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> so, it was a All crazy right. ride, man. Yeah, yeah it was whole... fun. It was fun. Uh, it was fun to watch your career. I don't want to keep you too much, but the real reason you're here is you're promoting your book. You're on the end of this, getting close to the end of this 54 day book tour, which yeah. was your number. Why don't you speak on that a little bit? Yeah, that was a big part of why I wrote the book. I mean, we touched on it a little bit, but at the end of the day, I was like, I can help people with this and, and help them, you know, tap into the power of the mind and visualization and what we're truly capable of. And the other part was to give back to the, to the burn fund. Cause again, like I said, you know, that burn unit is the people that work there are special people because it is not a fun place to, to recover with those types of injuries. So yeah, at the end of the day, I'm like, I can give back. And so that was a big part of this, fundraiser so for the first 54 days as of october 25th which is so we have nine days left and 54 was my number in vancouver uh 40 percent of the the profits from the book uh it's called fighter are going back to the burn fund so and that was from 40 percent second third degree burns so don't get out listeners the book is you, called fighter defying the nhl odds right yeah yeah, if anything, I promise you'll be entertained. Let's say that. Well, visualize all these people buying these books, Aaron, and maybe we'll, we'll do <laughs> I, some good. Yeah, that's where. Hey, that's what my practice looks like now. It looks a little bit different than than playing hockey, right? But uh, it's it's not just for athletes. It can translate into anything, right? I agree. So achieve, believe it, achieve it. Is that the the saying? How it goes? I don't. <laughs> you're I'm warm. not good with that. Warm. <laughs> I, I'm not good with that kind of stuff. But anyways, is there right. anything else you want to touch on, Aaron or Tim, before we get out of here? I'm good. No, I think that was great. That was great, Aaron. You never know what to expect when these in interviews. I, I always come in with this, like, this is going to well, suck. I'm going to be bored. Because that's it happens where you get these players on. It's just like, gosh, he's just like dry. Watch him paint dry. <laughs> but this was fantastic. I, I really I appreciate, appreciate it coming again. on. I think everyone's got a story, right? Yeah. Um, some are bad some are so boring <laughs> that's fair <laughs> <laughs> no you're very very uh, well spoken thanks for coming on i, I appreciate it and hey, all the best man going yeah, man, forward thank you everybody yeah. go out get his book what is it fighter defying the odds road to the nhl i butchered the title defying the nhl odds yeah yeah so go out pick what can they pick it up anywhere amazon yeah yeah, Amazon on my website, AaronValpatti.com. Um, Amazon's probably the yeah the bet the easiest. So get it yeah. within the it's next nine days. So you make some money. Yeah, get some money to that burn unit. It's a good stuff. Aaron, thank you for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Good luck with everything. Cheers, Thanks, everybody. guys. Appreciate it. Thank you.